kids. Can y'all look at me for a minute? I just dropped my paper. Uh, I'm going to read from the Bible. So I want you to listen to the story because I bet Miss Rebecca's going to talk about it in a minute. Okay? All of you join me in worship as we listen to the word of the Lord. I'm reading from the book of Philippians, the first 18 verses. This is Paul writing to the Philippians. So first we begin with his salutation as he speaks to them, and then he gives his prayer. I don't know if this is, is this on? Okay. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints of Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So he's telling them all hello. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who became, began a good work among you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart for all of you sharing God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with the knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best so that in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Christ. Jesus Christ in the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater bolder, and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others pro proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or truth. And in that, I rejoice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some of you may have heard that I was um, at a conference last week in Denver, Colorado, which was lovely and we had a great time. Um, that, but the conference was about... Um, what do you do after the storm has passed? So we've all gone through this storm together, collectively, um, and we've all been impacted a little bit differently by this storm, um, but all of us have gone through it together. And so how do we as a church address that? How do we talk about that? And we were talking about spiritual practices, which are the things that we do to build resilience, which is a great word, right? Resilience is our ability to keep going when something happens to us. So hopefully your car is resilient, right? <laughs> Their construction hopefully is resilient. Um, the things that we, we do to build ourselves up so we can make it through things, and we were talking about um, what different spiritual practices might look like. So you might listen to Christian music on the radio. That could be a spiritual practice. Or you might pray, or you might go to Bible study, or whatever. And one of the preachers who was talking said, you know, my spiritual practice is getting to stand up and talk to people for a week, for every week. And everybody in the room nodded, and I, went, and I thought, yeah, it is. So I just want to say, first of all, thank you. <laughs> Seriously. 
Like, this is a privilege. I get to get up and stand and talk about God. And so I have a built-in spiritual practice that you guys pay me for. Um, and so it's a little easier for me. And I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. It really is a privilege and a gift that you offer to me. So thank you. Will you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and God. Amen. Philippians is such a great book of the Bible. It's one of the ones that we crochet on pillows. Um, as you know, it's the one with the verse that I, I can do all things through God who strengthens me. You know that verse. And what makes it so special is that this is probably Paul's last words to his very favorite church. Now, preachers aren't supposed to have favorites. Like parents, we're not supposed to have a favorite child. And we're not supposed to have favorite churches either. But Paul's not very good at not you know, telling people when he likes them and doesn't like them. And so Philippians is very clearly his favorite church. In fact, he tells them that multiple times in the letter in case they've forgotten. You're my favorite. Don't tell the other churches. And what makes the church at Philippi so special for Paul is that this is the church that was started when he was in prison. Now, you remember the story from last week where Paul was in prison and he was singing hymns and being generally annoying to his fellow prisoners. And the prison guard was saved through Paul's acts. Well, the prison guard goes on to found a church, which is a great sign of redemption. And it's this church. It's the church at Philippi. That is why this church is so special to Paul. Because he saw it birthed. He was there when the founder of the church came to faith. And he nurtured the church over time. And now we see a Paul who is in jail again. He's gone now through three shipwrecks. He's been in jail three times. And this time he's in serious big boy jail, you know, the ones I'm talking about, maximum security with all the chain link fence and the barbed wires and the guard dogs and those kinds of things. He's in Rome. And Paul knows that this is the end. This is the end of the story for Paul. He's not going to get to write any more letters to Philippi. He's not going to get to write any more letters to anyone else for that matter. The only people he can witness to are the people who are imprisoning him. But Paul has built resilience. Paul knows how to minister to people in the midst of his storm, of his own personal loss, of his own personal grief. He knows this is the end of the story. He knows his date is coming. It's not going to be far in the future. And he has one last thing to say. And it's thank you. Thank you for being church. Thank you for lifting me up and praying for me. Thank you for being present in my life. Paul had a date with destiny, a date, an end time that he knew was coming. And he sits down and writes a letter that says, thank you. Now, some of us are given the gift to look back over our lives. Some of us are given the opportunity to look back over our lives when we know that the end is coming. And there are lots of kinds of ends in our lives. We have lots of these, these transition, these markers. We graduate from high school and we have that opportunity to look back over through our childhood. We get married and we have that opportunity to go back and look over our maybe sordid dating history, right? We get a divorce and we have the opportunity to look back over our lives. We have these dates where we can look back and we can see and we can understand what has brought us to the place where we are. But I don't know that we're very good at that. For one thing, our memories are really bad. And I don't mean like memories like, like me where you walk into a room and you have forgotten that you were there while you went in the room in the first place. Anybody else? Yes. I mean, that's short-term memory loss that I'm afraid is only going to get worse. I'm blaming my children currently. <laughs> or the kinds of memories where you don't remember what you ate for breakfast yesterday. <laughs> Have you ever gone to the doctor and had to take a memory test and they say, what did you eat for breakfast yesterday? And it takes you a little while to remember. 
And you have that moment of panic, right? What did I eat for breakfast yesterday? <laughs> did I eat breakfast yesterday? Not that kind of memory, right? Where our memory really struggles is in those events that happened like 10 years ago, right? I mean, I mean, think about it. You have told us, that I bet, a story so many times that it has become true, whether or not that is the truth of what has happened. Mm -hmm. I told people for years that I messed up my knee playing soccer. I did not, no. I just assumed I did, right? <laughs> I messed it up in gym class, falling down, right? I was running laps because they make you do that in gym for some reason. I was a music major. Why did I have to take gym class? Anyway, um, that's how I messed up my knee. I have a trick knee because I fell down in gym class. I thought it was a soccer injury. Totally wrong memory, right? And I bet if you think about it, you have a few of those too. <coughs> now here's the thing about trauma any kind of trauma, whatever trauma it is that you've experienced, your memory will not be correct about that trauma. Every person ever who's ever gone through something traumatic, the first thing that happens is your memory is wrong. And not about the event. Your memory is wrong about what happened before the event. So I want you to conjure in your mind what life was like in December of 2019. What was happening in your life? How do you feel about it? Generally good, right? I guarantee you that it was not as nice as you remember it, right? I hear people talk all the time about um, the death of the church globally. And you know, and I've heard many people say that it was the coronavirus's fault. Has anybody else heard this? Everybody left church because of the virus, right? You've heard people say this. Church attendance in the United States began, to, began declining. You know what year? 1963 was the peak of church attendance. It is not the virus's fault, folks, right? Now, there's lots of complicated reasons, and this isn't a sermon about that. It's just to point out that our memories of things are not always right. That sometimes we think of things in a different way because we've been through this filtering event. And it's really convenient to blame everything on it, right? Now, Paul, in this letter, could have filtered his experiences of church life based on the idea that he was in jail. He's in jail because he was a preacher. And I don't know about you, but if I were Paul, my letter would not have been so nice. I was doing this for you, and you didn't do anything to come and get me. Why am I here? Shouldn't you be here with me, right? Ever sent an email like that? But Paul chooses instead to see the truth. To see the memories, the way that those memories bubble up, the way that the truth of grace bubbles up. Now, grace is a tricky thing. It doesn't often appear to us in a way that we can remember. It doesn't always appear to us in a way that's like a geyser or a volcano. It would be lovely if God's grace would just, sh like, pfft. Right? If we could point to a moment where God's grace fireworked over our head, if we could point to a moment where we were showered in God's grace, and maybe you can, and if you can, I would... I'm thankful for that opportunity. But most of us have little moments, little things that bubble up, moments of God's grace. And it gets harder and harder to see the farther and farther away we get from it. Sometimes our memory of God's work in our lives is distorted by our belief that we did it for ourselves that we were the ones who made it happen. That if we just wore our lucky jersey, maybe our football team would win, right? We do this with faith, too. We think if we move a candle three inches to the right that God's not going to appear anymore, right? Because our memory is that when the candle was over there, 
there were 300 people in the church, right? But that's not how God's grace works. And that's not how our memories of God's grace work. God's grace works in little bubbling moments of everyday life. When people tell us stories of God appearing in their lives, when we remember life for what it really is. Moments of grass, little pebbles, big stones, waterfalls, and all through it, little bubbles of grace. And so I invite you, when you think about your life, When whatever it is that happens comes and you have an opportunity to look back, I invite you to sit instead with the bubbles of grace and not the rocks of mistakes or in the it could have beens or it should have beens or if I'd only done this. Bubbles of grace, little springs, And then maybe you can write a letter like Paul in the midst of that and say, thank you. Thank you for the little moments where I saw the water. Thank you for the pebbles where I needed you most. Thank you for the rocks. And thank you most of all for the truth, for memories that are clear and spirits of resilience. Little bubbles of grace. Amen.